each week come up with new music and all that kind of stuff. So we really appreciate all the guys that do that, all the women. Too. Thanks, um, well, today we're going to talk a little bit about encouragement. Um, I know maybe after the last couple of weeks, after hearing about you know Pastor Randy and all that kind of stuff, I know a lot of people are kind of sad about that and unhappy or uh, discouraged. And so I just thought today we might need to hear a little bit about encouragement and kind of what that means. So um, there's a story. There's a married couple. Um, they just went to bed on a stormy night. It's raining and stuff. They're in bed and uh, hear a loud knock on the door. Okay. Knocking on the door. So the guy gets up. He's, you know, kind of frustrated. Goes downstairs, you know, opens up the door. Like, what? You know, what do you, what do you want? Well, there's this guy standing there saying, you know, I can't get my car started. You know, can you, can you give me a push? And the guy's like, you know, he could tell he was drunk and kind of out of it and stuff. So he said no and slammed the door and said, you know, we'll worry about it in the morning or something. So he goes back upstairs, right? Well, he goes back upstairs and his wife's not too happy. You know, she's kind of, well, that, you know, that's not the very Christian thing to do now, is it? Now, you just sent this guy back out into the storm and, you know, with no help or anything like that. So he said, fine. So he gets back up, gets his coat on, goes back downstairs. You know, he's like, nothing's, you know, my life's not going to be good until I do something about this, right? So he goes back outside. He, open, you know, he opens the door. It's raining hard. You can't see anything. So, um, so he kind of yells out, you know, hello, are you still there? And then, you know, what can I do to help? Well, the man replied, you know, can you give me a push? Okay. Well, I'd be happy to if I could see you, but w w where are you? I'm over here in your swing. <laughs> so that's a little funny. Yeah, you kind of get it. Uh, um, have you have you ever experienced being someplace and your car won't start? Um, I know we have one young lady over here who has a lot of issues with cars. <laughs> Uh, and Randy had a lot of issues with cars the past couple few weeks. So, um, but you ever been any place and your your car just it won't start? You go to start it, you know, it won't start. It's dead, right? Battery's dead. Everything else in the car works. It seems like it should be fine, right? Everything else works, just right. There's no juice, no spark, right, to get it going. Well, in the long run, there may be several solutions to that, but in the short run. Uh, the solution is usually to have another car come alongside, hook up some jumper cables, um, and hook up their strong battery to your weak one and jump start it, right? So it's drawing alongside that power and that energy from the good car to get your car up and going and functioning again, right? Okay, we've all been there. Well, the act of drawing alongside or lending energy to get another one going is the basic idea behind a key word in the New Testament, encouragement, right, or to encourage. Um, an example of someone in the New Testament um, who had a particular reputation for encouragement um, was a man whose parents originally named him Joseph, but the people, the early leaders in the church uh, named him Barnabas, which literally meant son of encouragement. Okay, Barnabas was a person that you felt good being around, right? He's one of those guys, you know, those people. You've been around them that just, you know, they're they're just good to be around, right? Randy is like that. Randy's he's just a good guy, right? People like to be around him. He's very encouraging. Okay, um, he was a man who believed in the potential of people, um, particularly those whom others were kind of cautious or suspicious of, right? Um, Barnabas was, Barnabas was willing to give a failure a second chance. And because of this uh, kind of predisposition or default setting towards encouraging people, that's why the leaders gave him that name, Barnabas, okay, son of encouragement. All right, one of the main reasons why I want to talk about the um, life of Barnabas is to see if there's some aspects of his life, um, his encouragement DNA, so to speak, that we could kind of take in and make a part of our life, our personality, okay? Uh, people like to be with people that encourage them, right? Right? Do you like to be around that person that's always griping about every single little thing or, you know, this, that, and the other? We don't. We like to be around people who are joyful and encouraging and caring, right? Um, so uh, to be a Barnabas towards others is to exercise a powerful influence on people, 
right? In terms of the root meaning of the word encourage, it simply means to put courage in, okay? It means the inputting or infusion of power or advice or inspiration that makes another person perform better, okay? There are times when each of us have a dead battery, right? We're just, we're down, right? Encouragement means coming alongside and inputting courage or attitudes that make us get going again, right? We need that from others. There are many things in life that cause us to experience discouragement. Um, the draining of courage. Sometimes it's a crisis, right? Uh, sometimes it's just simply we're wore out, we're tired, we've been burning the candle at both ends, um, maybe we're sick, um, maybe sometimes just somebody's hurt you by you know, some, using some, some words, some cutting words or actions towards you that really hurt you deeply, right? And it's discouraging. To encourage is to do the direct opposite. Where courage has dissipated encouragement, encouragement is the replacing or replenishment of that courage. It represents putting back what has been taken and that which is leaked out of us, right? Romans 12, 8, and it's up there, and it's kind of a part of, that's kind of a short part um, right there. You could go just read read all of Romans 12, just 12, 1, um, or not 12, 1, sorry, but Romans chapter 12. Um, but it indicates in this verse right here that, that, that it's a special gift of the Holy Spirit uh, to encourage. The act of being encouraging is, though, a responsibility of all of us, all believers. Um, uh, we are also supposed to be like Barnabas to a greater or lesser degree. There are fellow people, fellow pilgrims on this journey in life with us that we are called to come alongside, right? Come alongside them and encourage them and be that person that's pouring more courage into them, right? Um, Randy did this for me and my family, you know, almost two years ago. Um, as we went through some some hard stuff in Montrose there with the church there, and you know, Randy came alongside of me and said, "Hey, let's let's do this. You know, we can we can make it through this." And and um, and he just encouraged me. And uh, and so I just want to say my appreciation to him for that. And I know he's done that for many others and many other people in his ministry throughout the throughout the years. So how do we do it? What are some practical ways um, that we can be Barnabas to people? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you six um, suggestions here, but they're not, they're not the only ones. But I'm gonna, we're going to talk about six of them today. All right, number one. Should come up there. All right, it's to allow people to grow. Okay, we've got to allow people to grow. By that I mean, um, God is working on people, right? He's working on people and their spiritual maturity. It's not a static thing, right? Just like we grow up from a baby to adulthood, same thing in our spiritual lives with our with our. Uh, relationship with Christ. We are on a journey and we're maturing. We're learning, right? So we got to allow people to grow. People change and do better as the Holy Spirit works on them, works on their life. A Barnabas encourager expects people to grow and mature and even overtake their mentors as God continues to work on them, right? So you got to let... Let people grow. They're not always going to be where you're at. And you're not always going to be where somebody else is. And sometimes that's frustrating. There's an interesting illustration of this relationship, and that's with uh, the relationship Barnabas had with Paul, okay, the apostle. In the early days, after Paul's conversion, it was Barnabas who was willing to give him a chance, right? Um, he probably wasn't too excited about it, right? Paul, who was Saul, they all knew him. They knew who he was. He was persecuting them, killing Christians. And so and then all of a sudden, God tells him, hey, go meet this guy and take care of him, right? Well, the other Christian leaders were pretty suspicious of Paul, even after his conversion. And Barnabas is kind of walking along with him. Well, I mean, all the leaders, Peter and all these folks, I mean, 
they're kind of suspicious, right? Um, but, you know, later on it was Barnabas who went to them and got Paul, you know, went to them and said, hey, he's good. He's ready to go. Let's let's work with him. This is what God's got going for us. So, um, he also introduced Paul to pastoral ministry in the Church of Antioch. And in his early days, Barnabas mentored Paul and coached him in the ways of Christian ministry. Okay, Paul didn't just all of a sudden become the you know the Apostle Paul or what we think of the Apostle Paul. It says then Barnabas and Paul launched into missionary work. Right, they started traveling all over, uh, spreading the gospel. And once again, in those early days, if you look at the historical records, they always mentioned Barnabas and Paul. Because Barnabas was the leader and Paul was the apprentice. Okay, And in the culture, the historical culture of that day, that was, that was the tradition. You always mentioned the leader first before the student or apprentice. Um, but however, later on in the book of Acts, we read about Paul and Barnabas. And rather than Barnabas and Paul, at some point in their journeys... It starts becoming Paul and Barnabas. Okay, and the implication is that Barnabas, Barnabas kind of swapped spots with Paul, um, and uh, so the leader allowed his prodigy to grow and mature, and even kind of rise above his leadership. And so we got to allow people to grow. He wasn't enamored with prestige or position or title. He merely wanted to serve the Lord. A Barnabas like that is willing to believe in what God can do in a person's life to the extent that they are willing to step aside or allow their servant to become their leader. Okay, The person under their spiritual care or apprenticeship is allowed to grow up and take the lead. They are not forever viewed as a junior or younger Christian. And the Barnabas in us allows, in, <clears throat> in us allows them to grow and take their place in leadership. And that's how the church should be, right? We should be maturing, walking alongside of people, encouraging one another, allowing that person to grow, and they may even grow further on or take on more leadership responsibility than us. All right, number two, affirm the capability that you see in other people. In the beginning of the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, there's an interesting challenge to encouragement. Moses has been telling the Israelite community that because of their stubbornness and rebellion uh, and faithlessness, that none of the older generation is going to enter the promised land. That they had been traveling, they've been traveling for forty years to try to get to this place, right? And uh, and they're not going. God's not going to let them go in. He told them they would all die in the desert, and he <laughs> and he wouldn't even make it into the promised land himself. But however, young Joshua was a different story. So in Deuteronomy 1, 37-38, it says, Because of you, the Lord became angry with me also, this is Moses talking, and said, You shall not enter it either, but your assistant Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him, because he will lead Israel to inherit it. In short, people were to recognize the hand of the Lord on Joshua. Okay, they've been following Moses for decades. Right, he was he was Moses, right? And now he's saying, you know, not even I am going in there with you, but God has said Joshua is going to lead the people into it. And so now you have this young guy kind of coming up above Moses, and so he's commanding them, you've got to pour your encouragement, your courage into this guy now, and not just look at me. Um, the same sentiment is echoed in Deuteronomy three twenty eight. It says, but commission Joshua and encourage and strengthen him, for he will lead this people across and will cause them to inherit the land that you will see. The implication is that people will affirm the Lord's call or mantle on Joshua. They were to speak to him, into, into him words of courage and strength and support. Joshua would be emboldened by their encouraging words that people spoke to him, affirming the capabilities they saw God had given him. Okay, and that is the task that we, as for lack of a better word, Barnabites are to fulfill. We are to see the growing competency in other people and affirm it or express our support. Um, there's the old saying that says, "Behind every successful man is a surprised mother-in-law." 
uh, no, uh, is a wife who believes in them, right? And I know this to true from, uh, I can do some of these things without the support of my wife. And I know many, all of us here would agree with that. Great things are achieved by great people, and great people are supported by significant others who have spoken affirming words of courage and inspiration into their lives. Okay. Believing what people can become is a very Barnabas type thing to do. Okay. Not just looking where somebody is, um, but where they could go. You know, it's uh, we can't just judge them by what they look like or where they're at now in their spiritual maturity, but where they have the potential to go. All right, number three, point people to the opportunity side of the problem. Okay, surrounding every dark and gloomy cloud, there is always a silver lining. Whatever the devil means for our harm, God can turn around and use for good, right? And for his glory. The person with a Barnabas type disposition sees problems as opportunities, as opportunities, sorry, and not disasters. That's why James could say to the Christians who were facing severe persecution, okay, at this time the Christians are getting persecuted by the Romans, by the Jews, and whoever else. I mean, but they're they're being per persecuted. Okay, just like Paul or Saul was doing it to them. It was pretty pretty bad. Okay, they didn't have a bunch of rights and all kinds of things or go sue somebody or whatever like we do here in our society, right? So this is why he could say this in James chapter 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may mature and complete, be com be Mature and complete, not lacking anything. Okay? So look at that right there. Perseverance must finish its work. Okay? We're a, we're a society of instant gratification. So that's very hard. This is a hard verse for us. Right? Because we shouldn't ever experience anything that's not joy. Right? We should be comfortable all the time. Right? That's kind of what we feel. Our air conditioner goes out or... You know what? You know we get we get pretty upset. Um, you know, and yet there's people all over the world that are being persecuted for their faith. They got nothing, right? And we and we can get pretty upset about some piddly little things. Um, but sometimes we go through some pretty hard stuff, right? Um, some pretty big trials. And going through that, that perseverance, we got to let that perseverance finish its work. We can't cut it off short because when it's finished and we went through that and made it out to the other side, then what does it say there? So that you may be mature and complete. So that's a part of the maturing process, right? And then we can lack, we'll be lacking anything, okay? So in other words, the encourager looks behind, beyond the immediate pain or suffering to what God is painting on the big picture, right? I know this, we hear this word like, you know, what is the big picture? And some people are little picture people, and some people are big picture people, right? I'm more of a big picture picture person. My wife is more of the details, right? Little person, little picture kind of thing. Um, and all of us are like that, but we gotta look at what God's ultimate goal is, right? Um, Corey Tim Boone tells an amazing story along these lines in her book, The Hiding Place. She and her sister Betsy had been imprisoned by the Nazis for harboring Jews in their home. The prison camp that they were in was apparently riddled with fleas. The conditions were absolutely horrific and beyond imagination. So if you can imagine a Nazi prison camp, okay. However, during the time of prayer that Corey once had with her sister Betsy, she heard her pray, Lord, thank you for the fleas. And Corey couldn't go on in their prayer meeting without stopping her and asking her sister, you know, why, why are you praying along those lines? Why are you thanking God for the fleas? You know, to which her sister Betsy lovingly explained from her heart, Corey, don't you see? The Lord provided the fleas. That way the guards will not bother us in our barracks so that we can pray and worship freely. In other words, Betsy had Barnabas eyes to see the positive side of a difficult circumstance. Okay? It would be hard for us if, you know, if we had fleas in our house, we wouldn't be singing for joy, right? Or praying, thank God for the fleas. 
or ants or whatever it is that passes right there. But but she was looking at it from a different perspective, right? From God's perspective. The guards didn't want to go in there because they didn't want to get bit and fleas all over them. So it was kind of a saving grace. Being a Barnabas doesn't necessarily minimize the pain and suffering that a person goes through. Okay? It is more than just being supremely positive. Uh, if you met you met those people too, right? Sometimes they're just kind of annoyingly positive. Um, Joe Osteen, if you see him smile on TV or whatever, it's kind of like that. Um, but in whatever we go through, there is always a bigger picture that God is painting, and a Barnabas type encourager helps people to see that. Okay, so it's our job to encourage one another, right? By helping people when they're going through something, see what that bigger picture might be. Um, all right, so number four. All right. We need to speak prophetically to one another. I know we're Baptists, so just bear with me here, okay? All right, on, the, on at least two occasions in his letter to the Corinthians, uh, the Christ, Corinthian Christians, Paul clarified that the primary purpose of po prophecy was being was for encouragement. Okay, wasn't to you know prophesy the future and you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and uh, you're going to win you know you're going to win the lottery next week, or you're going to meet the love of your life. Um, we tend to see, I think, when we hear the word prophecy and stuff, we think about like commercials we see on TV for psychic, you know call the psychic hotline. You know, that's kind of what we see, I think. Now, you may not, but that's kind of what I think a lot of people kind of picture as someone prophesying or whatever. Uh, but the primary purpose was for encouragement. 1 Corinthians 14.3 says, But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. 14.31 says, For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Okay? The word of God is given so that others in the family might feel built up and encouraged. And the person with the Barnabas type disposition has an active antenna. They're listening, they're looking for what God might be saying to a person in their circle of acquaintance. Okay? Um, you know, I can recall a number of occasions um, when people in my life have just shared a word with me or something that they were sensing or seeing. Um, that was a great, it was an encouragement or maybe helped me decide on the path to take or a decision to make. Um, but I want to encourage us to grow in sharing with each other the prophetic insight that God has given us. Okay? Sometimes... God, that's why we need to be so alert to what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives, right? That's what the Holy Spirit is for. You know, you might come into a congregation today and had a conversation with somebody, and, you know, God might just be putting a word on your heart, you know, to, to lift them up or ask them if there's anything they need, you know, what's going on, those types of things. Because a lot of us, we put on our church face, right? We do, and we're good at it. I mean, we can put it on everything's great, you know, I'm doing well, you know, whatever, you know, but, you know, you might be dealing with some really hard stuff or maybe there's some really serious things that you're, that you're dealing with, but we don't like to share those with people, you know. Um, but that's why God gave people. That's why he gave us a fellowship, right, so that we could come and be encouraged, right? So we need to be listening, listening for that, be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Um, for those with more courage and experience, bring a, pro a prophetic word in a large church gathering like this, um, you know, might be a little too much. And that's why I kind of made the Baptist reference, you know, we, we kind of, we're a little more reserved. Um, now, it can go off on the other end as well, but I think there's probably somewhere in between where we need to kind of be striving for. Um, so doing that up, just standing up in a group and maybe doing something like that is probably going to be a little scary for a lot of us. Um, but however, for others in a small group context, you know, why do we have small groups? Why do we have you know Sunday school classes or Bible studies or whatever? So you have those small groups so you know people, 
So you know, when, and you're even more sensitive to when someone needs encouragement or some love or just a friendly hug or smile, right? Um, it's perfectly okay, though, to temper your prophetic words with, you know, I'm not for sure, uh, but I have a hunch, I feel, a sense God's kind of telling me this um, to tell you. Or, you know, when I was thinking about you the other day, you know, I just kind of had this picture in my mind or something, kind of God just, you know, sometimes we have that and we feel it or we want to say something to somebody, but then we, you know, either we feel embarrassed or something, you know, whatever it is, we kind of, kind of snuff it out and don't always say what we need to. So, so I'm not saying, you know, to go around and start telling people that they're going to win the lottery and things like that, but uh, God definitely is telling us to encourage one another. So obviously all prophetic words need to be held lightly and tested, um, but we need to grow in our experience of encouraging each other with what we sense God saying to us, right? And so this goes a little bit into the next point, number five. Sorry, those aren't big enough up there. Um, tell stories about what God is doing in your life. Okay? When Paul wrote his letter to the Christians in Philippi, he was in prison. Right? Got, Paul spent a good amount of time in prison, right? And on the one hand, it was sad, desperate situation. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, I know Chris down here works at the jail, you know, but they get fed and, you know, they're taken care of. Our prisoners are fairly taken care of. Not as a place I want to go, but or most of us want to go. But the prisons back then were probably not too nice. Probably some dark, dank hole in a rock that they carved out or something like that. Chained. Usually he was chained to a guard or something like that. Or another prisoner. Um, so it was pretty scary. And all the Christians at this time, like I said, are being persecuted. So they're, they're scared, right? But... A beloved brother in Christ, was get, uh, he was getting a hard time, so they were, they were scared. No one likes the idea of persecution and fear and the fear of something similar happening to them. Okay, It would have sent shivers down their backs to know what was happening to him. But as we noted before, around the dark cloud of persecution and suffering, there's always a silver lining. And in the midst of his imprisonment, Paul was being effective as an evangelist. Right? He had a captive audience, and God was using a bad situation for incredible good. Okay, you got to think about the big picture, what God was doing of the times, right? The Romans had built roads to everywhere. People were traveling. They were moving Paul around, or he was in this prison or that prison. So now he's, he's converting this Roman soldier over here. Um, that Roman soldier may have not been from Rome. He may have been from some other country. Or whatever, and so how the gospel was spread was is a pretty amazing thing when you look into it, and at the specific point in time that that was happening in history. Um, so even though it was a crappy situation to be in prison, he, God was still using it, right? And as Paul Paul told the story of how God was at work in his situation, it provided a powerful um, word of encouragement to other people that God would turn their suffering into good also. So Philippians 1.14 says, Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. So they thought, if Paul can do this, he can deal with this, you know, so can we, and they would just made them even more bold. So never underestimate the power of storytelling. In fact, storytelling is the best way to kind of cast a vision and a hope Amongst people who you're leading, right? We want to. We we are moved by stories. Why do we? Why is the entertainment industry so big, right? Because we love movies or books or whatever it is. Because we love stories. We love good stories because they speak to us, right? Um, stories hook into our feelings and our emotions, uh, which of course is why Jesus used them every day, right? He used the parables to communicate the nature. Of the kingdom of God. He used stories, right? And people related to him, right? So when we hear how God has worked in the life of a fellow Christian, it raises hope and faith in us. If God can do it for them, it helps me believe that God can do it for me also. The only caveat I would say when you're telling a story is to be honest, though. Not to embellish it too much and, and kind of just 
concentrate on the victories or whatever and um, things like that. So we get into the prosperity gospel, and if you just, you know, have this much faith, or you just believe this or that, you're gonna, you deserve, everybody deserves to be rich, and everybody deserves to be healthy, and if you're not, you know, you just don't have enough faith or whatever. But it's always on. They always talk about, you know, well, I God gave me a million dollar house for nothing, you know, or whatever. I mean, those are the things. So be honest, right? Um, you know, we uh, there's some good things in there for to know some of those victories, but uh, but we also need to tell stories of our struggles and our failures, okay, and how God met us in the midst of those struggles and failures, okay. That's that's at least in my experience, is where God has taught me way more when I was really going through something um, that I didn't want to go through. Um, but that's where he taught me, right? And he brought me through to the other side. And now we all have different things we've been through. And so how does that help us when we have other believers that we come in contact with or friends when they're going through something? Right when we can relate, or you can really minister to somebody who's going through something similar that you've been through. You can say, "I've been there." This is what God taught me through that. Okay. Um, so at times, life is darn hard work, and we need to get good at telling stories of God's activity with <clears throat> with us within the midst of our struggles, as well as our triumphs, the good things too that God has done for us. And that's what Paul is alluding to in verse uh, in this verse in, Philipp in Philippians one. Paul was suffering in change, yet God was evidently with him and in the midst of his suffering. And the story gave courage to others. Okay, so number six. Okay, this is the part I really wanted to kind of hit on today just because of kind of what the, some of the struggles and what we're going through are going to be going through here in this church. Be committed to Christian community. Okay? Be committed. So what do I mean by that? According to the New Testament, to have an encouragement mindset means having a high value of belonging to community of faith. To be a Christian according to the New Testament is to belong to a fellowship of believers and the practice of coming together with fellowship to fellowship with other Christians. And it's expressly stated uh, as an act of mutual encouragement. We do not know for certain who wrote the New Testament book of Hebrews. Uh, there's a few clues. Um, many scholars believe that it was Barnabas. Um, if we look at chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, says this and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds let us not give up meeting together as our as some are in the habit of doing but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching so one of the ways we encourage each other in the Christian faith is to gather together right doing what we're doing right now um, you know, the opposite of that is true, like not fellowshipping, not coming, not being a part of a community of believers. And what's that lead to? It leads to discouragement a lot of times, apathy, all kinds of things. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As arpen, ah, arpen, sorry, as iron sharpens iron, uh, so one man sharpens another. Okay? Coming together with fellow Christians and being part of a Christian community encourage fellow believers in their walk right with the Lord like two burning hot coals right if you put them together or many coals together they give off heat and they take heat from one another right and get hotter and burn more right but if you just separate them you took two coals and separated them they're kind of just slowly gonna just, they're gonna go out because then they're just they're just giving off heat and not also in a turn taking the heat okay so one of the sad kind of tragedies of our contemporary Christianity is this spirit of consumerism that kind of pervades the church. Okay, and that's that that kind of you know what is it? What's in it for me? 
So if I'm going to go there, what do I get out of it? And that, I mean, it's kind of rare. Not all of us. Um, I've been to a lot of churches over my life, and and if you read a lot of things and see kind of what's going in, going on in the big picture of uh, church in America, it, it is as a, as a very pervasive attitude. You know, what's in it for me? You know, not what can I bring to the table. Um, you know, we went to a large church back in Oklahoma, and I'd heard of people that would, they, you know, they'd come there for the music or whatever, and then go over to another church for the preaching, and, you know, this over here, or vice versa, you know, because it's what, you know, well, I like this, that's what I'm getting out of, it's for me, and then I like the way the guy preaches over here, so I'm going to go over here and listen to him preach. It's not that they are really part of a Christian community. Um... So, if my personal needs have not been met, then why bother going to church? So, in contrast to that, Hebrews 10.25 suggests that there's another reason for being in community with other Christians. And apparently it's not what I get out of the exercise, but more importantly, what I am able to give other people. Okay? And to put that a little more strongly, is like having a low view, so having a low view, not a very good view of coming together and what it means to fellowship with one another um, is not just it's not just about me missing out it's also about me robbing other people of what I'm capable of inputting into them so if you think about it more along those lines what can I contribute how can I encourage somebody um, how can I help somebody and in turn those people are doing that for you and others um, when we worship together or pray together or play together you know I observe I observe from up here Randy observes other people observe you know what's, what's going on in your life what is the Lord doing in your life and that's encouraging right um, same thing here if, if I weren't here or you weren't here or Randy's not here this week you know we miss out on what they bring to the table right or what we can do for them maybe how we can help them or encourage them if we were really serious about behaving in a Barnabas type manner towards other people then one of the best places to start that start adopting a high value of Christian community being a crit, uh, is to be a part of a church right being Christian is much more than just a simple personal belief system it's about belonging to a community of faith that encourages other people. It's not about me and Jesus. It's about we and Jesus, right? Um, and we need to think about that as we go forward. Um, you know, Randy has been here the last few years, and we've seen we've seen what's happened here. A lot of encouragement, right? A lot of people, people are coming. And why do people come? Because they feel loved or they feel welcome. They feel encouraged. Um, you know, they feel the relationships that they meet with other people, right? And so things have, things have grown. We've got several people in this church that have been here for a long, long time and have seen a lot of things. And not too long ago, it wasn't too good, right? And, and now... Look at what's changed in just a short period of time. Okay? And Randy, me, anybody else, you know, you shouldn't be here for us or for Randy, a particular preacher um, standing up here. Um, you know, you should be here because this is your community. This is your community of faith, your fellowship of believers. Okay? Pastors, speakers, teachers, all that, they're, they're going to come and go. Um, but you are the body of Christ here. You are this community. okay? And so we need to encourage one another. I know there's a lot of people in here that are, that are hurting and sad about, about the unruhs going back over there. But you know what? we got to look at what that bigger picture is, right? A few years ago, it was hard to look at that bigger picture, right? You probably didn't see all this happening in the way that's grown, the things that have changed, right? And so we have to look at that same thing and keep that momentum going, okay? Keep that momentum going. Keep that encouraging. Go encourage one another. 
go out of your way um, for some of the folks that you may know. It's maybe a little more difficult for some than others. Um, but to know God's going to bring somebody else. Okay? And they're just here to share the word with you and to encourage you and to build relationships. Okay? They're not up here to be a personality. Right? Um, and to just get as many accolades as they can. Right? Okay? We're all called. You know? Some of you might be up here. I know we have the elders preach and some other folks, but one day, one of y'all out sitting out there might be up here preaching. You don't know. Everybody should try it once just to <laughs> see how it is. But, um, but that's what I want to leave you with today. I just wanted to encourage you and let you know, hey, there are a lot of great folks here. Randy's going to still be in, involved and around. He's not just you know, jumping ship or anything like that. He's very involved in, you know, getting the right person over here to follow up with him, uh, from him and everything. And so be praying towards that and thinking about that and thinking about what it is you can contribute. Remember, it's not about what, what you can get. What, how can you encourage somebody? Um, how can you be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit when they're saying to you, Maybe you need to say this to this person, or here's kind of a vision or something, a picture I've given you uh, to share with this person um, and stuff like that. So I just want to challenge you and encourage you to be, really be praying about these next several months, especially praying about who's who's God going to bring. You know, what other things, what other big picture things could happen down the road here at Calvary Baptist. Because we've already seen it a lot just in the last few years. And so God's not done with this church yet just because the pastor's leaving. So um, we'll just have a time if you want to come up here.